icon, and we'll start again. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We gather here on Treaty 7 land, the area of the Foothills Métis Nation, in gratitude, in honor for the gift of this land and those who have cared for it for millennia. We gather our hearts to worship God, the creator of all that is. Let us gather our hearts as we sing together, this is the day that God has made. Please welcome each other to worship this morning. As we gather uh, a few things just to note, um, after worship today, David's going to be in the parlor to talk to those who might like to uh, join as a member of the United Church. Uh, 
be baptized, confirmed, transferred, uh, and sort of go through that service. We're planning on having that service on in two Sundays on April 28th. If people want to join and can't make it, uh, we will arrange for another time. But so if you're interested in being a formal member of the United Church, uh, you can meet David in the parlor after worship. Uh, as we gather, I uh, just want to let you know that uh, we're ordering in large print copies of these days again. Uh, there's always an extra couple copies. This is actually from January, February, March, but there's still wonderful um, reflections to read each day. And the extra copies are on the greeters table uh, so that you know that they're there if you want to pick one up. Uh, for the next two Sundays, I think we could use people to make coffee. So if and going forward till the end of June. So if you're uh, able to sign up for a Sunday, that'd be great. It's always nice to have time to chat after the service and and be together that way. We're here to support one another and uh, just want to invite you to hold Janet Clee and her grandson Sam in your prayers. Um, Janet's daughter, uh, Andrea, passed away suddenly on Friday evening. And uh, so uh, David and Elaine Mansfield and others have been over offering support. And uh, we just hold them tenderly in our hearts right now. And uh, we'll have further information as we go forward. I'd like to welcome those joining us by live stream and who watch the recording later. Just to let you know, if you want to follow along in a bulletin, I do post them ahead of the Sunday under sermons in print and video under the worship resources. Uh, if you want to print one out for yourself to be able to follow along with the prayers and the order of service. And, and we are grateful that you're joining us uh, today and, and can be part of worship in this way. Our call to worship is printed in your bulletin this morning. Please respond with the words in boldface lettering. Tis the season of Easter, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. With the disciples, we journeyed through Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. With the disciples, we waited in grief and despair. With the disciples, we greeted an empty tomb and possibility renewed. With the disciples, we shouted from joyous hearts, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Like the first disciples, we welcome Christ's presence within us, around us, and among us. For Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I'd like to invite Misha to come forward, and together we'll light the Christ candle as everyone sings, Halle, Halle, Halle. Please join me in the opening prayer. God of hope and possibility, God of joy and compassion, we gather once again as your people, as disciples of the way of Jesus. We gather because for us, living must be centered on Christ, 
proclaiming compassion, provoking one another to love and good deeds, and spurring each other on to generosity and faithfulness. For us to live is Christ. We declare this with boldness, O God, and ask your blessing upon us as we gather today. Amen. Good morning. So the mission and service message is supporting a rights-based approach to growing food. And it talks about agroecology in this message. And just a refresher that ecology is the study of organisms and how they interact with the environment around them. Agroecology is sustainable farming that works with nature. So you can keep that in mind. So A A D E S, it stands for the Association of Economic and Social Development. ADES works closely with community to grow food in a rural region of El Salvador. The association called Santa Marta, a mission and service partner, is located in an area of Central America that is very vulnerable to climate change. And this hot, dry region regularly experiences drought. So mining projects have also negatively affected the environment and, of course, the people in the region. ADES and other community organizations decided to act to protect the community's right to a healthy environment. So an example of how they responded is a three-year agroecology project co-funded by the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation and the United Church of Canada Foundation, along with Mission and Service. You can keep in mind this Manitoba Council for International Cooperation has a number of partners, being United Church of Canada. And if you look it up, you'll find they do wonderful work all over the world, and it may surprise you. Agroecology benefits the land and water because it recycles nutrients back into the soil. It also reduces production costs lessening the financial burden on rural farmers. In this project, ADES works closely with the community to grow food in a rural region of El Salvador, promoting a sustainable agriculture that protects biodiversity, maintains the integrity of the land, and upholds rural culture. That may sound like um, organic farming. Organic farming comes under the umbrella of agroecology. At the center of the project is the Dora Alicia Sorto School Farm, where rural families, mainly led by women, learn about agroecology. The school provides training, technical expertise, and seeds indigenous to that region. It focuses on preserving the surrounding environment and on and on upholding gender and human rights as part of its approach to food security. So your gifts to mission and service help support this ecology, agroecology project. So thank you for your generosity. And just a little note, when I googled Dora Alicia Sorto School Farm, a short video made by the United Church of Canada came up and they've got a translator, but the ladies are telling you how this project began and uh, their involvement. So thank you.
online session I was taking part in recently, a book study called Canoeing the Mountains, and if you want to hear about that, I'll tell you about the book sometime. But um, one of the challenges was to state in about 10 words what our purpose was as disciples of Jesus, following Jesus as a congregation. And so I looked at what we say as, a con as our church, and it would be for Jesus bringing help, home, hope, and healing to our community. It has to have a verb in it. And then state as succinctly as possible. So here is the challenge I put out to you. To come up with your own statement. Ten words about less, not really more has to have a verb in it, an action, stating what are you about as a follower of Jesus? And then share them with me. You don't have to do it right on the spot, okay? <laughs> and I know, Patty Ann, maybe the children and youth will come up with something today too, I bet. So let's sing. We're going to sing This Is The Day, another version of it. It'll be in English and French and English. Bruce, can you go to the French... Um, the French verses, yeah, I just want to go over the French, yeah. Voici le jour que Dieu a fait, nous le vivons dans la joie. 
Voici le jour que Dieu a fait, nous le vivons dans la joie. Chantant, chantant, allélu, chantant, allélu, chantant, allélu, nous le vivons dans la joie. So, let's sing together, English and then French and then English. You can do it. <laughs> Please join me in the prayer of illumination. We receive your words today, O God, so that we may live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. May it be so. Amen. Today's letter from Paul to the Philippians is <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 12 to 27, and this is Paul's present circumstance. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment for Christ and most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord in my imprisonment, they dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, and others from goodwill. These proclaim, proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Well, just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. 
It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now, as always, in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, and that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. Herein is good news. Thanks be to God. Every year, each United Church congregation fills in a statistical form to submit to the National Offices of the United Church of Canada. Not one of my favorite tasks. This form also includes information about numbers, attending worship and attending various church programs, number of confirmed active members, number of adherents, financial numbers, names of ministers and council members, and you get the idea. This year, a new question appeared. How many volunteer hours are contributed by people in your congregation? This question led to an interesting discussion by our church council. Are we volunteers here at church? Or do we see what we offer in this context in a different way? The unanimous agreement was that we don't volunteer at church in the same way we might volunteer for another organization. Our contributions made to our community of faith, of time, energy, skills, and resources are about living a call to discipleship. It is about vocation, not volunteering. As one person said, Jesus didn't call volunteers to give a few weeks, a few hours of a week to his cause. Jesus called disciples to, vol to devote themselves fully, body, mind, and spirit, to living the way he taught. Jesus called disciples, not volunteers. Being disciples of Jesus, then, was about a total commitment. The disciples left everything behind to follow Jesus and gave their whole selves to learning from him and later preaching the good news that he shared. Being disciples of Jesus today also means total commitment. We aren't just disciples for a couple of hours on Sunday morning or when we drop by the church to participate in something during the week. When we choose to follow the way of Jesus, we shape all of our lives around that choice and commitment. Every aspect of our lives is carried out from the perspective of being a disciple of Jesus. Body, mind, and spirit, we seek to be attuned to the spirit of Jesus. Then, when we volunteer for other organizations, we do so out of our belief that Jesus calls us to love and serve others. In our paid labor and professions, we work with excellence, care, and compassion that are called out of us as disciples of Jesus. When we have a difficult interaction with another person, perhaps in a grocery store or with a family member, 
We seek to respond with clarity and respect, doing as much as we can, knowing not it's, it's not all up to us, but doing as much as we can to bridge and build relationships just as Jesus did. Our rising and our sleeping, our working and our playing, our living and our dying are all reflections of our commitment to following the way of Jesus. For the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter to the Philippians, that is abundantly clear. In the portion of the letter that we heard this morning, he declares, For me, living is Christ and dying is gain. He goes on to speak of living one's life in a manner worthy of the gospel. For Paul, following Jesus is an all-in thing, not just a few hours, once a week or two. To celebrate my confirmation at the age of 14 through Acme United Church, I made a cake for myself that looked like an open book, and on it I put these words of Paul, to me to live is Christ. These words from Philippians. I'm not totally sure how or why at the age of 14 I came to choose those words, but still today they reflect for me the commitment I was making through my confirmation as a member of the United Church of Canada. At that age, I hadn't, still, hadn't yet discovered my call to ordain ministry, yet those words were more predictive than I could have imagined. To me, to live is Christ. Yet one doesn't have to be a minister to answer the call to discipleship. Day by day, week by week, I see you people in this congregation and people in other congregations living your lives in total commitment to the way of Jesus. I see the spirit of Jesus in the energy and care that you offer, not only in this community of faith, but in everything that you do. I see it. To me, to live is Christ. That is what we are about. We are disciples of Jesus, not volunteers. Paul writes to the Philippians words of encouragement and inspiration. He says to them, some people proclaim Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, intending to increase my suffering. Paul was willing to live for Christ, suffer for Christ, and die for Christ. He was truly all in once he embraced Jesus. In fact, Paul was just that kind of person. When he was persecuting Christians, he did so with total commitment and enthusiasm. Now that he was a follower of Jesus, he lived and preached with total commitment to the way of Jesus. Paul was never half-hearted about anything. So Paul encourages the Philippians to also be wholehearted in their commitment to the way of Jesus. However, he warns them to be aware of the intentions and values which drive their commitment to Jesus. He names that some who claim to follow Jesus have envy, rivalry, and selfish ambition as motives for their preaching and teaching. Others, he notes, preach, teach, and care for others out of love and goodwill. This kind of preaching and teaching, he says, is worthy of the gospel, while those who work out of selfish ambition add to his suffering. It brings us to this question, why do we follow Jesus? Why do we embrace the faith of Jesus? Why in the world do we want to align ourselves with God's purpose in the world, a purpose revealed to us through Jesus? So these are going to be our questions as we journey through this spring now. Why do we want to be involved in God's purpose for the world? Why is it important to us? Why align ourselves with God's purpose? Why do we want to be counted as followers of Jesus? Especially when it is something that we have to give our whole selves to, not just a few hours a week. 
Jesus calls disciples, not volunteers. That is what Paul knew, even though the word volunteer didn't exist in his time. It wasn't created till the late 16th century. But Paul knew the joy of being a disciple of Jesus, and he knew that that joy came from giving the whole self to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. This isn't necessarily about evangelizing or converting people, though that may happen. Rather, it is about living and breathing the gospel and letting the gospel shape each decision, each interaction, each intention, each word spoken, and each value by which we live. For Paul, as he describes it to the church in Philippi, God's purpose in the world is to bring joy and compassion to other people, to approach others with goodwill, and to act out of love. It is to forego envy, rivalry, and selfish ambition, and to boldly share the wonder and hope of the gospel. It is about living and acting in a way that does not cause suffering or add to the suffering of other people. Paul goes on to write in the next part of his letter these amazing words, and I always come back to them. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus our Lord. That sums up the reasons that Paul wants to be aligned with God's purposes in the world, it sums up what Paul understands to be God's purposes in the world. Paul declares that he wants those who follow Jesus to shine like stars in the world. Another way of putting this is that in following Jesus, we are blessed so that we may be a blessing in the world. To me, to live is Christ, wrote Paul. When we embrace Christ, we, and we commit ourselves fully and enthusiastically to Christ, then we too declare, to me, to live is Christ. When we let being Christian shape all of our living, then we have so much to offer this world. As we bless others, we too then are blessed in the giving. A Swiss philosopher of the 1800s, Henri Frédéric Amiel, put it this way, Life is short. We don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. May it be so as we live for Christ. Amen. A week ago, we felt the breath of winter. <laughs> This week, we're feeling the breath of spring. Uh, this is a hymn written by a United Church uh, minister several decades ago, as comes the breath of spring.
Please be seated. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this place we breathe in your spirit. We breathe in the presence of Jesus. We breathe in the gift of community. In this place, we bring all that is in our hearts. The things that we are feeling grateful for today. The concerns that we carry. The frustrations that we are feeling. the roadblocks we've come up against in our lives. The grief that is in our hearts. We bring this all to be wrapped in your love, O God, to be held in the care of this community. because we are here as disciples of Jesus, as followers of the way of Jesus, as people who have embraced the faith of Jesus, who brought everything to you, his joys and frustrations, his hope and his frustration. In this place, we bring to you all the prayers of our hearts. And we take up our privilege and our commitment to pray for others. Today, we hold Janet Clee and grandson Sam and all the family in our hearts as they grieve the death of Andrea. Enfold them, embrace them, and show us how we best can offer our support. We pray for all who are grieving today. Those here among us, those in our congregation, those in this community and beyond. We pray for those in hospital, those who are feeling ill today, those who are lonely, those who are overcome by despair. We pray for those who are seeking new opportunities and possibilities, open doors. Oh God, open doors. We pray for family and friends that we hold concerns for. And we pray for our world, aware of so many places that need compassion and peace. We think of Ukraine. 
of Gaza and Israel and that whole situation which is so complicated. We think of Haiti and Sudan and other places where there needs to be wisdom, wisdom that calls to account leaders, wisdom that speaks ways of peace and healing and compassion. Gracious God, receive all of our prayers from the depths of our hearts. Receive our worries, our needs, our hopes, our joys. And guide us this day and every day as we follow the way of Jesus wholeheartedly and with conviction. For it is in his name that we offer all of our prayers and gather our prayers together as we offer together our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Out of the gratitude and hope of our hearts, we present our offerings. Gracious God, we bring all the gifts of our hearts and lives, the ways that we serve you day by day, the ways that we share your love and compassion. And we bring these gifts that they might support this congregation here and beyond in bringing help, home, hope, and healing in Christ's name to this community and to the world. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us sing together as a fire is meant for burning.
let us go and live for Christ, live as disciples of Christ, sharing the hope, the compassion, the joy that is in our hearts because we are followers of Jesus. And this we know, that the grace of Christ attends us, the love of God surrounds us, and the Holy Spirit keeps us now and forevermore. And everyone responds. Amen. Amen. Thank you.